Hello? Okay. So I think we are ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cristina Vasilescu. I will be the moderator of the workshop today. Um, I'm happy to welcome you here for our workshop on cultural heritage as a source for societal well-being in uh, European regions. This is actually a workshop featuring the results of a two-year applied research of ESPON. Um, I hope it will be interesting for, uh, for you to hear about how cultural heritage impacts on societal uh, well-being. I will just introduce a little bit how our session works today. We, have, uh, we will start with a brief introduction from Mr. Zedarowski, uh, ESPON AGCC director. Afterwards, we will introduce in a snapshot the project and its main findings. We had to select a little bit because it's a two-year project and in eight minutes we cannot say everything, but the final report will be out on the ESPON website soon so you can check it everything in detail. And uh, the project manager, Mrs. Manuela Samek, which is director of the labor market and productive systems and policies of the Institute for Social, uh, Social Research in uh, Milan will uh, deliver in a snapshot the main uh, results and the projects. Uh, afterwards, we will continue our uh, debate. Hopefully, this will be a debate and not only a presentation with uh, an introduction of how COVID-19 impacted on cultural heritage. Uh, which will be delivered by, uh, in a remote by Professor Victoria Atteca. And we will also have an in-depth uh, in -depth findings from um, one of our case studies, the Man Museum in Italy. Uh, the results will be presented by Professor Erika Melloni. We will go on with a session with, uh, on a special topic. This is uh, Contested Neglected Heritage. Uh, and uh, strategies for uh, valorizing contested neglected heritage for societal well-being purpose. Uh, it will be introduced by Andreas Wiesand, which is uh, director of ERICARTS. Uh, and afterwards, we will have two case studies featuring in-depth uh, results. One is uh, a case study in Spain, uh, delivered by Victoria Ateca, Arquitecturas de la Memoria, and another one is about Sami restitution, restitution of the Sami heritage, delivered by uh, Professor uh, Gro Grovin in Norway, University of Oslo. Uh, we will end with our last session on cohesion policy and uh, investments in cultural heritage and effects on uh, societal well-being, which will be delivered again by uh, Mrs. Uh, Samek, uh, Professor Manuela Samek, and also with an in-depth case study by Andrew Ostrom. So I will just leave the floor for the introduction to Mr. Zedarowski. Thank you very much and welcome so many of you in this uh, interesting room at, at the attic of the uh, industrial building. So uh, if we are, say, short enough, we could have a bit of a time here to go out and enjoy the, the panorama. And also I was uh, instructed to inform you that sharp at four o'clock there will be a sightseeing tour here in the premises. So we should be disciplined. A very quick introduction. Thanks a lot for taking up this very important uh, topic as a research consortium. We are happy to, to have you here. And indeed, this has been a long project, uh, the final result of which just been delivered. So um, this is the first opportunity for the team to present the, uh, the outcomes at large, but not the last one. Uh, depending on the interests, we offering further opportunities to engage with the practitioners, researchers, and policy makers in something that we'll be calling knowledge development activities. This is evidence production. This is the outreach. But then you may think of how we could use results of this specific project in your regions, in your territories. And please don't hesitate to ask even provocative questions so that we can see how then we can tailor those knowledge development activities to the appetite, interest, and preferences of the people on the ground. So without further ado, back to 
Christina, and then we'll be happy to hear a lot. It, I'll be it, uh, actually then concentrating on the associate, associate, uh, societal well-being, sorry for that, societal well-being, and also then how we could bounce forward from the, uh, from the crisis uh, generated by COVID. So, thank you again. Thank you, and I will not uh, say many things, just introduce Manuela, who will present in a snapshot the project and the main findings. Thank you. Okay, thank you for being with us. Uh, I will try in eight minutes to summarize what we have done. Of course, we do not have time to go in details, but the three uh, sessions that are just after this one, the three brief presentation will focus on specific issues that we have uh, considered during this project. So first of all, what are the main aims of this project? Well, the idea was to try to develop a pan-European methodology at territorial uh, level to see what uh, are the impacts of cultural heritage on social well-being. Of course, this issue is very complex. Uh, it was very hard to first to define what we intend for cultural heritage, what we intend for social well-being, how we can find operational definitions that can be used for the analysis. Um, we, you, you see there the research activity. The first one, the first step was to define the conceptual framework. And in order to do this, we did a literature review, but also a part we adopted a participatory approach with a deliberative event with stakeholders of cultural heritage to see together with them how we can define these two uh, societal well-being and cultural heritage and what kind of relation can we try to measure between these two uh, variables. And then we did the analysis, and I will tell you what the methodology was. We, we put together quantitative and quant qualitative methodology at European and local level. And then uh, we did a lot of outreach activity discussing uh, data, indicators, but also case studies result with uh, uh, European and local stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So first, first issue, how can we define cultural heritage? There is no common uh, <laughs> acknowledged definition among uh, all uh, stakeholders and countries. We decide to adopt the Faro Convention definition, which is mainly uh, focusing on the fact that heritage is produced by the interaction of our time between people and places. And so it is community-based, so it can be different across different areas, and it is also changing over time. And here, for example, all the issue of contested heritage comes up, and Andreas will uh, present you our findings on that. It, it, heritage has an intrinsic value, but also needs uh, investment to produce effects also on societal well-being. And uh, at the end, we decide to consider three main interconnected dimensions and forms of heritage, tangible heritage, intangible heritage, and combines forms of mixed cultural heritage, including digital heritage. And uh, then, uh, as I already anticipated, we consider specific uh, forms of controversial or neglected heritage. Relating to societal well-being, again, uh, here the idea was to consider both the individual and societal dimension of well-being, and so we consider three main dimensions, again, of well-being, uh, each one articulated in different uh, under-dimensions, sub-dimensions. The first one is quality of life, which is more, more related to indiv the individual uh, feeling of well-being uh, related to education, skills, uh, uh, knowledge, uh, quality and sustainability of the environment, life satisfaction, happiness, health, and so on. The societal cohesion dimension, more related to communities, so enga community engagement, equal opportunities and empower 
development of different groups of population in the community, human rights, place identity and says, sense of belonging, integration and inclusion of disadvantaged groups, and uh, reconciliation of relations within communities. And we will see this dimension is coming up as rather relevant. And then the material condition dimension, which is the one who has been most considered in the literature associated to cultural heritage, so the capacity of heritage to produce, to improve territorial attractiveness and uh, to support uh, the creation of jobs, businesses, uh, and uh, earnings, earnings, but also affecting housing condition, property prices in communities around um, uh, heritage. In uh, trying to, to, sorry, does it go on? Okay, in trying to develop a, a, a conceptual uh, approach to the relation between heritage and societal well-being, there are two main issues that we had to deal with. The first was how to develop an operational definition of these two dimensions, well-being and cultural heritage, that are measurable and av uh, with available data and comparable across countries. And this was really a challenge because there are no good indicators of cultural heritage in, in, this, in the three different uh, uh, dimensions that we, have, uh, we wanted to consider. And then we had to define what kind of relationship should we measure between heritage and societal well-being. The problem here is that we should define a structure of relationship that takes into account the heterogeneity of impacts. Impacts may be very different across uh, territorial areas, across uh, population groups, uh, across time, and so it is not possible to use only one method to measure it. And so for this reason, we will see, we had to consider a multi-method way to uh, uh, try to measure this uh, relationship. Um, the, in order to develop the conceptual approach, we used uh, the theory of change approach, which put together inputs, outputs, and outcome among the different dimensions of uh, heritage and uh, well-being. And we had to start with some assumption so the idea was that heritage affects societal well-being not only per se, but also through specific strategies, valorization strategies that regulate, preserve, valorize, make accessible heritage for uh, people. Accessibility of cultural heritage is crucial for participation in it, and we will see participation is a key variable for heritage to produce well-being effects. Uh, heritage impacts transversally on all the dimensions of well-being with in interlinkage uh, impacts. And also we have to consider that there are intervening factors that can affect the relation between heritage and well-being. And the, the specific example was the COVID. Uh, pandemic, we change completely the way people can access uh, heritage and the way heritage can be um, widespread and can have effects on well-being. So how did we deal with these, all these um, challenges? We used a multi, uh, yeah, I know, it's a multi-method uh, uh, approach. So we use both quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, method. We did uh, also an analysis at pan-European level and at local micro level. The first one was an econometric analysis based on a valuable data source, mainly Eurostat data, but also on big data, TripAdvisor, Wikipedia data. 
a descriptive analysis of administrative data on intangible heritage, the UNESCO list, and on the gender balance in the direction of state funded museum, and also quality quantitative analysis of primary data. We carried out a cross country population survey in eight ESPON countries with more, almost 9,000 respondents, and we also did a stakeholder survey on contested heritage. And then we carried out at the local level to look at the mechanism uh, explaining the linkages that we have seen uh, from the econometric analysis and for, from the other analysis. We looked, we consider eight case studies and some of them will be presented today. And then the third strand of analysis was looking at European investment in cultural heritage. We did a mapping of investment from the European structural funds and creative Europe programs and a qualitative analysis of the evaluations with also interviews of um, the European <coughs> capital of culture program looking at eight capitals where they invested a lot on, on cultural heritage. Very briefly, the main result, this is the theory of change, <laughs> I, I'm not going into it, uh, model. The main result, are, um, well, first of all, we have a consistency of result across all the different methodology we used, and all of them show that heritage contributes positively and transversally to all the dimension of well-being. Some, some dimension and sub-dimensions are more impacted than others, and here they are. There is, of course, a bi-directional relationship. Heritage impacts positively on well-being, but also in those areas where people are better off in terms of social and economic conditions, they invest more in heritage, and so there is a, a sort of circularity in, uh, in, the, in this relation. There are also negative impacts of uh, cultural heritage, and not only in terms of over-tourism or congestions in areas where heritage is attracting a lot of tourists, so the problems relating to the increase in housing prices, uh, congestions, gentrification, and so on, but also conflict and controversies over heritage. And this is, for example, in the Sami case, is very interesting because it can be an occasion anyway, if it is properly uh, managed, to uh, reconciliate uh, different groups into community in, uh, in uh, discussing who, what is the cultural heritage of the area and who is represented by this heritage. Um, well, yeah, and then uh, uh, heritage affects uh, well-being in very uh, interconnected way. Other uh, results are that, as I was saying before, uh, that uh, the effects depends very much on the investment, the valorization, valorization policies that are carried out to improve the capacity of heritage to have a societal well-being effect. So they need to be accessible and participated. Participation is very important to enhance the positive effects of uh, heritage on uh, societal well-being, and this means improving the sense of ownership, identifi identification, and so on, and the issue about narratives of cultural heritage, which become very important in uh, um, facilitating this positive effect of heritage on local community. Uh, the effects of heritage are uh, context, context uh, dependent. Uh, as I was saying before, the social recognition of heritage is very va depending on the, cont the place, but also over time. It changes over time. And also, as I said before, the impact is greater where there are better uh, economic and uh, social conditions. Final uh, part, what are the policy implications? Well, some of them are similar to what we were discussing this morning. Um, first of all, in order to produce well-being, heritage must be valorized. 
uh, there is the need to uh, produce inclusive cultural heritage narratives in the valorization strategy. It is necessary to um, design strategies that mitigate the possible negative effects. It is important to support participation, so co-projecting, uh, co, uh, co-designing, and so on. This is what we were discussing this morning. Uh, so participatory approach in the design, delivery, monitoring, and evaluation of valorization strategy. Ensure accessibility. Here there are some very concrete uh, examples uh, to ensure accessibility of heritage, also to marginalize people and marginalize area, to bring heritage also in peripheral areas, in rural areas, and to um, support access and participation of people that are usually left out. Uh, and there are very interesting examples in the, in the case study. The, the decentralization, strengthening information, attention to accessibility also in terms of transportation system, digital infrastructure, and so on. And then also this issue about uh, how to make uh, uh, heritage uh, initiatives sustainable over time. And here the issue is to support a multi-sector and multi-level governance uh, uh, of, uh, of um, cultural heritage strategy into local national <laughs> development uh, plans. So uh, embedding it in also in other sectors like economic development, social development, uh, education, and so on. And then the another big issue is the problem of data. There, there are very few good data on uh, cultural heritage, but also on societal well-being. So there is the issue of developing a common agreed framework for the definition of indicators and for data collection on these, uh, um, on these variables in order to be able to provide more evidence and to assess the impact of uh, heritage on societal well-being. Sorry for taking too long. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. We will give the floor for questions afterwards because we are a little bit uh, behind the schedule. I will uh, just pass the floor to Victoria Teca Amnestoy, Associate Professor, University of Basque, for uh, presenting how COVID-19 impacts on cultural heritage. Victoria, the floor is yours. So here. Thank you very much. Sorry, but I can't hear you. Sorry, there is an echo. Yes. yes. <laughs> Maybe you can use headphones because it seems this is the problem. That this works now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So may we see the presentation, please? So this is going to be a brief presentation about one of the methods that uh, Manuela was talking about. This is about uh, how, if you don't ask, you would never know. 
Of course, there were some antecedents that tried to map for the 28 members of the European Union into 2017, just one year before the European Year of Cultural Heritage, there was an intent in order to know more about the habits and the perceptions that uh, European citizens had about cultural heritage. However, there were a few limitations. The first one is uh, the passing of time. The second one was uh, the consideration of uh, cultural heritage, which is being uh, becoming much more integrated. And the limits that we had to use in this project in order to classify tangible, intangible, and digital or digi digitized cultural heritage are becoming less pronounced, more blurred. Uh, and also, it was relevant to, to use the dimensions of uh, societal well-being that were found to be relevant for this. Yeah. So, sorry, this is not the presentation. The presentation should read something like Harry World Survey. Yeah. And uh, uh, here, please. Next slide. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, and uh, so the aim was uh, here to conduct a survey uh, on a representative sample of the European population in order to investigate these first perceptions of the impacts uh, of cultural heritage on subjective well-being. Uh, there was a special attention about this context of COVID-19 under the assumption that, well, uh, cultural heritage is not only a societal construct, but it's more important um, we are, we want to derive pleasant heritage and collective experiences from our access to cultural heritage and social restrictions to mobility were uh, impeding this sort of social interaction. We considered eight countries, Belgium, Czech Republic, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Norway, Poland and Spain. They correspond with the countries for which case studies were conducted. And uh, it was uh, both the form and the intensity of engagement, the barriers because this is relevant for policymakers, the perceptions of the positive or negative impacts that the pandemic had on the view and also on the use of cultural heritage and last, these opinions and the awareness about the positive or negative impacts of cultural heritage on these different dimensions of well-being. Two more slides, please. Yeah, so the antecedents, we have already uh, discussed about this fact that the special Eurobarometer that was conducted in 2017 already gave us a good idea of the perceptions of uh, how individuals perceive that cultural heritage is important for them personally and also in these different levels of the community as a source of uh, societal cohesion and pride. Also in the vision that this can be, uh, that uh, societies can unlock the potential of cultural heritage and can perform these valorization policies in order to unlock material and societal benefits there were things that have to do also with the perceptions of over-tourism and different researchers have considered, well, the alternative ways of accessing cultural heritage. But, well, there is this increasing consideration of intangible cultural heritage, the COVID shocks, new patterns of cultural access that made it interesting to perform this research four years later. Next slide, please. So the findings. Um, Sorry, but uh, I cannot. Uh, I cannot see it quite here. But the most important thing is that, uh, well, most of the people declare that uh, they have some interest in cultural heritage. So they are not very much involved, but they are interested in cultural heritage activities, and they declare also that uh, they are casual visitors. That occasionally they access to cultural heritage. We can see that there are pronounced national differences, and these national differences that are persistent for the engagement, the barriers, the perceptions of the impacts of COVID, and also about the level of awareness of positive or negative impacts in quality of life, individual, societal cohesion, social, and material 
uh, social conditions. Uh, they are also country independent. And they are found to be related to how the concept of cultural heritage is built in different societies. For these media, access to cultural heritage, uh, if we want to go for this um, digital uh, impact, uh, well, this is important. The countries thought this is where this was more abundant was the Czech Republic and uh, the less uh, Norway. Next slide, please. So we also uh, explore which are the determinants that explain the difference or the classification that an individual chooses to get engaged uh, with cultural heritage in one way in an, or the other with more or less intensity. We found that no matter which country we consider, education is the best, the best predictor of this. Yeah, so the, the, the highest effect on this degree of engagement, the determinant that explains the higher probability for more intense participation, this is formal education, something that had already been found in other sources. And the effect of age, it's far from being homogeneous. We find one of these uh, specificities by country. Yeah? So it's not that this is a thing for all people, for young people, but the country specificities. Next one, please. So then we looked to the barriers. There are barriers that have to do with the individual conditions, yeah? perceiving individual conditions, but there are also some institutional or structural deficits that make it difficult to access. And this has a relevance in terms of policy making. Yeah? Individual barriers are typically high and difficult to address. If I lack time, then of course, the cultural heritage institutions could potentially adapt there is things, but uh, they cannot do lots of things in order to increase my time availability. However, for this not enough information, lack of reception facilities, and actually also somehow for this lack of time, if digitization could be an interesting venue, as the same for perceived high cost. Next slide, please. So. Regarding COVID-19 and the impacts on these habits and this perception, there was a broad question that was like, uh, well, so how did Corona pandemic uh, and the related restrictive measures, how did, did they impact on your behavior and your attitudes regarding cultural heritage? Next slide, please. And here, we've got that uh, for uh, a non-negligible part of the population, yeah. Well, the, the, the most frequent answers were that, well, people couldn't uh, access, they, they felt uh, sad or disappointed, worried about the consequences for the sector, worried about the material consequences of not having an economic activity linked with cultural heritage through, for instance, cultural tourism. But it's important to see that for, for many people, and there are variations by country here again, that it increased the desire, it increased is the plans in order to visit local in the country, in the region, more uh, cultural resources, or even to engage more. Next slide, please. So there were perceived negative impacts. Yeah. So the possibilities for social interactions, as I was mentioned before, these potential reper uh, negative repercussions for the cultural sector. Next slide, please. But still, this perceived positive impacts could be, for instance, more important. And this awareness about these positive expectations and the awareness about how the sector had been impacted for the good and for the bad were likely to be more present among the highly educated. Next slide, please. And then the other one, because we're running out of time, sorry. So the digital turn, but the idea of how uh, the pros and the cons of this digital turn had already been discussed by the COVID-19 and uh, about one third of the research that this had no relevant change for them during, regarding this use of internet and social media. Yeah, and uh, well, but uh, in some countries, uh, remarkably, uh, Norway and Germany, the, this had the, this was about half of the population that declared that this had uh, not a real big effect. So, well, uh, for some respondents, this new media turned out to be a real alternative for inspiration during the pandemic. 
And uh, we found that still a big proportion of the population declared themselves as being somehow acceptable to preferring the real experiences. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I will conclude. So some of these results, we can insert them into a broader picture. The first one has to do about this awareness of the existence of the digital and the digitized cultural heritage. For the time being, we found that most of these digital access, and even during the pandemic, this was seen first as a compliment. Yeah? So people, when planning a visit, uh, typically still the most visited web page is probably the schedule, the prices, and some contemporary uh, complementary information. When there was no possibility to have uh, real access to these due to mobility restrictions, then people move to these digitized uh, sources. But still, uh, the capacity of these heritage institutions to deliver digital cultural experiences, truly digital cultural experiences, no matter how big their efforts to digitize the single items, the assets of cultural heritage have been so far, this is still quite limited. We can think that, of course, during the pandemic, we can think about huge cultural infrastructures that were able to provide good quality digital heritage experiences to their visitors and to the citizens. However, many of the heritage institutions think about, think about local museums and things like that are really very difficult to reach this level. There are preferences of citizens to access cultural heritage sites as part of the social leisure activities. And still, many of these are linked to cultural tourism habits. So these are the main results and the implications that we got regarding the impact of COVID-19 and the possibilities of digitization. Thanks very much. And now I give the floor to Christina again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, I will just pass the floor to Erika Meloni to uh, introduce some of the digitization strategies used by the Mann Museum. Erika, the floor is yours. Echo, uh, echo me. Hello, uh, nice to meet you all. I will try to uh, very briefly, um, very shortly present. Uh, um, I can share the screen or are you going to uh, share for me, uh, uh, Christina? I'm sharing for you. I, I was seeing your okay. presentation, so. You just okay. have to say next, next, and I will move okay. the slides. Okay, thank you very much. So this case is about the Museum of um, Archaeology of uh, Naples. It's one of the ancient museum of archaeology in the world. And uh, um, we studied this, um, this case, we selected this case as a case studies of the Ariwell uh, project as uh, for its outstanding uh, outcomes in terms of accessibility uh, and in particular of digital engagement, of course, among the, the panorama, the landscape of the Italian museum. But the results were were quite uh, outstanding. In 2016, the museum issued its first uh, strategic plan, and this plan has the main goal of disseminating knowledge, stimulating the debate and the civic awareness around our common roots, starting from the Egyptian history. This goal has been pursued with the different streams of uh, activities that included restoration works, networking and partnering, of course, but also a strengthened strengthen accessibility of the museum with special attention to digitization. Uh, the man provided for a broad uh, definition of uh, accessibility. Please, the next uh, slide. Uh, uh, and uh, the next uh, as well. Um, uh, the next slide, please. Physical, cognitive, uh, economic, and uh, digital. And the next slide. Thank you. <laughs> this is the, the definition of accessibility of the first strategic plan of uh, um, Naples, of the museum, the Man Museum. After, after five years from the beginning, 2016, we can uh, we realized that this uh, study in 2020, 2000, 2021. Um, the, the museum showcase uh, data um, about the, a, a very uh, relevant enlargement of the museum audience. So if you can go ahead with the next slide, please, again. 
and and again um, a, a, a very a very um, a very large uh, increase enlargement of the museum audi audience both in terms of on-site visitors and online followers and also if you ask a paramount raise uh, in the ticket uh, ticketing revenues in these um, five years um, unfortunately the museum does not collect accurate information on its visitors for example in terms of origin gender age or level of ed education nor uh, has it analyzed the impact of its manifold initiatives uh, even though many of them uh, aim at leveraging uh, social outcomes however the digital uh, tools allows us for Further, uh, for a step further in the uh, knowledge of demands, uh, vi virtual visitors and impact on uh, so, uh, societal well-being. For example, uh, we, we are going to present some insights from the social networks. For example, here you can see uh, the Facebook audience that gathers people from 48 different countries, despite part quite almost uh, the social network activities of the museum is only in, uh, Itali in the Italian language. We can derive that in many cases the museum um, foreign followers, foreign brackets, are Italian speakers and perhaps Italian living abroad. Um, the same uh, the same data, next slide uh, please, the same data shows that the museum maintains uh, strong local roots the Campania region, where the man is located, accounts for two-thirds of the followers. And also the gender is, uh, uh, is uh, different from on-site visitors than uh, the social network online visitors. In fact, the, the, gender, uh, the gender, uh, gender split is uh, exactly um, the reverse. More female are connected, are, fo are the followers of the social networks uh, devices, while, while the information, the data from on-site visitors uh, show, uh, shows a higher proportion of uh, men uh, um, against uh, women. Next slide, please. Uh, we also analyzed the, the Italian uh, the, um, the the accesses to uh, uh, Italian Wikipedia page about the man. According to the data, the number of mobile accesses to the Wikipedia page decreases severely in correspondence to the um, uh, closures to the period the period of pandemic, and uh, uh, we can uh, while uh, um, growing when when uh, the, the lockdown is uh, terminated and people can go. To to visit uh, the, the museum, so we can uh, probably use uh, this kind of information as a proxy of the willingness uh, to visit uh, a museum. Next slide, please. But uh, the, 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 the other, uh, the, uh, the main uh, focus of our, uh, of our analysis is the, um, the, the analysis of uh, quite a new tool of the museum, the first online video game of the museum. Uh, the, the video game Father and Son that has been uh, issued in 2016 and downloaded, downloaded by 4.5 million people. Uh, in this uh, study, we analyzed uh, uh, a group of uh, 100 and uh, 1,200 about reviews in Italian and 7,500 reviews in the English language written by in between 2016 and 2020. 21. The content of the reviews has been analyzed through a free text analysis software, namely Iramutec. The clusterization of the text um, of, of the text of a group of reviews in Italian and English languages permit to identify uh, different forms of impact on societal well-being in terms of education. Uh, for example, the gamers know more about the past in terms of awareness about our on more roots, uh, thanks to the emotion roused by the game, and in terms of appreciation and proud about the Naples, the museum, and, and their historical treasures. So we can, uh, I, 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 very, I very rapidly go to the end of my presentation, and I am rushing to the, uh, to the, to, to the end. 
uh, we found that uh, uh, digital tools can contribute to specific societal well-being outcomes when they are embedded in a broader strategy of the institution de dealing with uh, heritage. And uh, we um, could uh, use uh, this information that we uh, derived from the analysis of so the social network to refine the theory of change, meaning the linkages uh, uh, between the strategy of, uh, um, of the strategic plan of the museum and uh, its uh, strategy of improve, improvement of accessibility and the, uh, and the related outcomes, in particular the societal outcomes related to the digital uh, strategy. And uh, thank you for the attention. I will conclude here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. And we are sorry because we have no time for the questions. Let's see if, how we manage at the end if we have some time. But we are available afterwards, even tomorrow. And you can also contact us through the emails for any kind of observation and question. I'm really sorry. I just pass the floor quickly to Andrea and to Mr. Viesand for the contested heritage. Hi. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, here we are. Well being or bad being. <laughs> um, at, at the right side, you see a, a monstrosity built in concrete, a monument and a memorial and meeting place of the Bulgarian Communist Party in Butslucha, which uh, demonstrates that heritage objects can be contested now and neglected at the same time. Uh, so it sometimes pays off to look at both sides of a medal. Um, while the Harry uh, well project uh, has demonstrated that cultural heritage has positive effects on societal well-being, we also uh, found uh, it necessary to look at potential bad being effects. Just think at the moment uh, of uh, the situation in um, Ukraine where cultural heri heritage sites are being bombed and some of, them, uh, some of them are apparently on purpose. So there's a lot of uh, anger and um, um, in, in this apparently so nice area of cultural heritage. We did our work um, based on desk research and conferences. I will skip the next slides to be faster. An evaluation of representative population surveys and the background uh, uh, through our own little survey we made among the country experts of the project. Uh, so. Yes, this was a conference we participated and uh, also contributed, uh, um, held by the German uh, ministry in charge of uh, uh, urban development, uh, which dealt ex uh, explicitly with the um, uh, d dissonant heritage in Europe. And so, um, Um, moment. Sorry. We had um, the uh, population survey you just heard about in the previous um, in the previous presentation, and um, there are three important issues that came out of that uh, survey for the question of contested heritage. First of all, again, look at both sides of the coin. As nice as the economic benefits of some heritage uh, is, obviously, um, it also has uh, disadvantages for a lot of people. Just look at uh, some uh, summer places in Venice or Florence, for example, called over-tourism and its uh, side effects. The ambivalent capacity of uh, cultural heritage to foster social cohesion. This was also uh, asked in the survey, and we had um, uh, we had uh, uh, clear answers from the population in these countries we surveyed 
that uh, some issues uh, uh, connected with heritage does have an, uh, definitely a negative impact. And then we uh, uh, have also the question of changing meaning or interpretations of heritage. Now, we ask specifically a question, the meaning of cultural heritage can change over time. Uh, um, uh, do you agree or disagree with that statement? And uh, I, I show here only the affirmative responses. Uh, the rest would be up to 100 the um, negative responses. Uh, we left out the don't know answers to make this clearer. Um, and it shows very, very uh, clearly that uh, a large part of the respondents are aware of this changing nature and changing meaning of heritage. Um, oh, here we have the Valle de los Caídos, uh, Caídos in Spain, the, uh, the site uh, where Franco used to be buried, uh, but that was built also by uh, prisoners of war in the, uh, from the 1930s. Um, we collected a lot of, uh, um, of cases from our country experts and analyzed them with an 80-question uh, uh, survey uh, and uh, could therefore find out a bit more about what is contested heritage. First of all, uh, in most cases, it's historical burdens, uh, like, for example, colonialism, uh, that uh, speeds up debates and heat, heated, uh, heats uh, the debates and uh, even actions, as we could see last year. Then also discrimination. That's more a feature um, connected with uh, intangible heritage activities. Financing. Uh, political military conflicts, yes, I just mentioned it. Bad protection rules um, play not such a big issues and other issues. Uh, out of these uh, different uh, questions we were asking, we could uh, find out that social cohesion is the most affected by uh, contested heritage. Um, uh, quality of life of stakeholders is also impaired uh, by almost three, uh, uh, three quarters. And also ma uh, material conditions um, play a role, let's put it this way. Um, now, we also asked whether or not these cases mentioned by the uh, experts were actually addressed uh, in some form by public authorities or uh, local or regional um, uh, institutions. This has been uh, um, quite often the case. Only in 13% of the cases, no reactions uh, were taken. Uh, a lot of uh, things played a role here. Media and internet campaigns were most important. Uh, parliamentary debates actually uh, were mentioned very frequently. Even protests, initiatives um, played a big role. And then, um, uh, of course, what <laughs> follows and is needed are documentation of the case, uh, experts research done into a background of, of a site. or um, Then uh, next comes restoration, legal remedies, um, up to the point, uh, which is still rare, real restitution of objects uh, that were unlawfully, for example, collected. Yeah, that's uh, basically my short introduction um, into an interesting uh, topic and uh, the full presentation you can later find with Espen. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. I know this was mission impossible. I will pass the floor directly to Victoria for introducing uh, a practice, so Architectura de la Memorias, and explaining a little bit more about contested neglected heritage at local level. Victoria, the floor is yours, and I will now come back with the slides. Thank you very much. Uh, 
let's see if I can fit it in six minutes or something like that. So I'm going to talk about Arquitectura de la Memoria. Eh? Arquitectura de la Memoria, this was uh, one of the case studies that was selected. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, I cannot see. I would like if someone else from the panel, yeah, Monica, no, and so if, if there can be more people from the panel joining, because otherwise I see the presentation this little, yeah? I cannot see it full screen, and this is killing me, yeah? Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, uh, heritage, at the end of the day, we uh, as uh, individuals in a society, we are stories, and heritage is about the stories, right? So this is a case study that was selected in order to illustrate how intangible cultural heritage could be digitized in order to be to increase the awareness of current generations, in order to be transmitted into the future. And this is in the context of, uh, uh, in Spain, for instance, for the case of Spain, in what's called the emptied Spain. Rural areas that are becoming older and older, that are losing population, they are facing how to cope with magnificent cultural heritage, which is very difficult and very expensive to preserve. So everything starts with the story of the inclusion of the Monasterio de San Antonio de Padua in the list of the seventh more endangered heritage sites in 2016 by Europa Nostra. So this was uh, one of the elements that was the list for that year and uh, well in the in the press release there was a, a call for public participation for participation volunteering as being one of the ways out in order to to preserve and to recover this neglected heritage next slide please so about the project, this was a participatory process of contemporary creation and co-creation that wanted to recover the intangible heritage and the intangible memory in Arroyas de Alconeta. This was performed during this first semester of 2019. This was previous in the COVID crisis. And they wanted to construct bridges between the past and present and the future, creating these ephemeral spaces for intergenerational dialogue. They created a digital tool in order to map this built heritage with the collective memory, the intangible memory around the village, uh, with some contemporary performative and plastic artworks that were created. And then the heritage or the, the new heritage that was derived was uh, born digital or digitized. This was an initiative of uh, a university, not a local university, but Aula de las Artes. This is uh, from the University Carlos III in Madrid. And uh, it received tiny external funding, around 25,000 euros from Art for Change grant of La Caixa. This is a a funding uh, organization, a financial uh, corporation, the, huge, the biggest financial corporation nowadays in Spain, and with the support of the council. Uh, so there was this space, co-creation, workshops with different collectives, crafts, and so on. So next slide, please. Everything started from when the people in this uh, group of uh, the arts uh, read there was a big public awareness campaign in the media in Spain. They saw the ministry and this sparked their creativity. They had some creativity and some uh, theatrical and dance projects about how to dance uh, doors, inner, outer spaces, lintels, and they started uh, considering that uh, they could probably go and dance them. What is Garrovillas de Alconetar? Well, Garrovillas de Alconetar, this is located in Extremadura, Spain. For the time being, this is uh, one of the, the, the only region uh, that is uh, classified as less developed regions so eligible in terms of uh, funding in different conditions from the rest of the regions in Spain. Uh, in terms of uh, material conditions, this is lagging behind uh, Spain, average Spain, average Europe. However, surprisingly, in terms of health-related outcomes, such as life expectancy, it ranks better. And it's one of these examples of the empty Spains, these rural and peripheral areas that are suffering uh, harder from disengagement, economic crisis, aging populations. Actually, uh, uh, it has less than 2,000 inhabitants for the first time, uh, less than uh, 2,000 inhabitants. Nearly one third is above 65 years old, and the COVID crisis had some devastating effects. 
there was a, a big fraction of this old population that was institutionalized. And in the first weeks, there was like a mortality of 40 people in the institution, in the, in the house. Okay. In terms of the well-being index, it also ranks below the, the average of the region. Next slide, please. But now, in terms of resources, in terms of the resources, one of the things that we did was a mapping of resources. And it turns out that uh, it contains some extraordinary elements of cultural heritage. It's not only the convent of San Antonio de Padua, uh, this element that was inscribed in the 20, 2016 uh, list by Europa Nostra, but where we made uh, a description, the type, whether if it could be classified as tangible, intangible mix, whether if there were some local stakeholder or advocates for the protection, whether if they were receiving this uh, structural funding uh, support, and we made made a mapping or out of this. Next slide, please. And well, what it happens is that uh, in Spain, we have this top level of protection, which are the goods of cultural interest, bienes de interés cultural, and uh, Garrovias del Corneta has about four of them, yeah, so huge. And we did mapping of the resources in terms of tangible, intangible, and digital, and whether if they were resources or output, so that if the project could create some new resources. Next slide, please. And we we'll, and the other one, so we also made uh, this list and the mapping of participants and stakeholders in order to see the effects. Yeah? All around these, uh, next slide, please. So all, uh, the output. So uh, what we believe that heritage is valuable for itself, right? There are these consensus, you go through the historical objective characteristics that deserves that this element is declared being the interest cultural, a good of cultural interest. However, uh, there should be some actions in order to put this into value. So there were um, these actions of deliberation, stakeholder management, participatory governance of cultural heritage. We need more examples of this if this is to be mainstreamed in European policies as has been intended for the last, let's say, five, ten years. Physical and sensor sensorial accessibility, conservation and preservation, education and training. Yeah? And achieving this preservation. Next slide, please. And we, we, we walk through this logic model and this uh, theory of change in order to map that the most important activities wanted to enhance the cognitive, the digital access and the awareness. What's out with this monster? This community happened to be, the local community happened to be very successful and very well doing these participatory governance practices of cultural heritage, right? They do crowdsourcing, they go, they tell their physical, their memories, there, there is a way of transmitting these, there, there is a way in which new contemporary creation can be uh, derived from their heritage resources. However, there are conflicting interests, right? There are conflicting interests and uh, they are able to uh, provide uh, the collection of a local museum they are able of undertaking these initiatives to preserve their intangible cultural heritage, to map their collective memory to the sites. However, when it comes to the preservation of, next slide please, of the huge monastery in a population with 2,000 people, inhabitants, this is absolutely impossible. This means that these places, they putting this into a broader picture, the some common challenges that all the rural and the populating and aging rural areas in Europe that have a rich, a tremendously rich cultural heritage have to face. And they need a strong leadership to deliberate about the role that cultural heritage will have in their economic and social development. There are always uh, conflicting relationships between regional, local, and national authorities, and the need for long-term cooperation is the mass. It's very difficult for these communities to unlock the potential of cultural heritage. So when we consider that these categories of neglected cultural heritage, we shouldn't blame on these local communities by default. So next slide, please. So this has been the presentation for the Arquitecturas de la Memoria. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. I will just 
rush into Oslo and pass the floor to Gro uh, Wien for uh, a snapshot of the SAMI restitution policy. Gro, the floor is yours, I hope we can see you. Yeah, I need to see my presentation as well, please. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, and can you also make the screen so that I can see my presentation? Yes. That's not the first slide. Okay, let me see how I can get back. No, no not that either. <laughs> Just continue. More. 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 This is the first slide. Okay, thank you. So, um, my uh, presentation is uh, is about um, uh, cultural heritage as a resource for Sami uh, archives, libraries, and museum institutions. And it's not uh, in relation to a particular exhibition or a project, as the title would indicate. I think I have a new title. Um, but it's rather in a long-term perspective. So it's about how, chi how cultural heritage can contribute to um, different kinds of individual and societal well-beings. And heritage in this perspective is both intangible and tangible, as uh, the category of institution speaks to, and uh, it also involves um, a number of formats, including uh, digital, and it's also controversial and neglected. And as demonstrated by the um, um, Harry Well quantitative study, connections between heritage and well-being are, comparatively speaking, more differentiated amongst the majority populations than minority populations. Um, the Sami communities can tend to be in, in closer contact with their communities, and there are several reasons for this. Uh, and, and one of them is that Sami, uh, Sami museums also house other institutions. And if you can wait for me to say when you should change the PowerPoint, that would be great. Um, so, but we stay on this one. Um, I will compare three institutions in three different parts of Norway. Um, the first institution, Simon Sita, is in the Sami, uh, in the southern Sami institution. There are uh, five. 500 to 800 Sami, Southern Sami speakers in the area. It's a very large area, and uh, Sami people live together with like a number of no Norwegian non-Sami people in this area. So it's a very, uh, it's an area threatened by a lot of development and uh, and quite a lot of racism. Ardan Luli Sami Institution is an institution in the, um, the on, which is in the yellow part on the map. Um, this uh, is, an, is an area with, um, it's a younger institution, the Samin City was founded in the 1970s after a um, political movement. Ardan was not, did not start until the 1980s and did not have any, um, uh, an, any uh, objects at all before the Sami uh, repatriation in, in, uh, in the in that like, was finished two years ago. A Kaltekönde Museum is part of uh, one of the is is the largest uh, institution. It's part of a very large Sami um, conglomerate of institutions. They have a number of uh, objects, five thousand objects. Of, they've collected objects for a long time. Uh, they're also in the Sami core areas, which is marked in green on the map, um, and they. Uh, also uh, are in an area full of other very significant Sami institutions. So they don't have the same role of collecting and connecting all kinds of other um, um, activities in the region as the other two that are smaller. Next slide, please. So this uh, comparison uh, is uh, based on a number of different methodologies. Uh, I have worked in this area for over 20 years. I have done exhibitions on these in these museums. I have worked on repatriation, on a re large scale repatriation uh, with these museums. I have uh, done interviews read statistics, white papers, reports, uh, spent a lot of time over many years on their social media, social media accounts and um, written a lot of uh, academic papers, both from Sami and non-Sami experts. Next slide, please. So the relevance of this case, in my opinion, uh, is that um, uh, there are um, uh, 
not, it's not just the uh, Sami museums that are archives, libraries and museums. This is also the case for a lot of other museums. Um, but uh, what happens in this case, there are a particular um, number of strategies um, that Sami museums do that are relevant also to ma majority museums in terms of how you build a community around your museums. Of, uh, of course, the difference between an, an, an indigenous museum and a majority museum is that an indigenous museum uh, are protected by a series of, um, of legal protections, both in international law, in European law, and in Norwegian or Scandinavian law. They also have access to a particular uh, range of funding uh, instruments that are not relevant to other people, but they're also amongst the worst funded uh, museums in Norway. And of course, another difference that is also very important is that the majority museum has to appeal to a wide range of audiences, heterogeneous audiences, while a Sami museum uh, relates to a very local, often, uh, audience. Next slide, please. So um, what these museums do um, uh, are next to the sort of making of exhibitions is that they uh, engage heritage through a number of different activities, uh, archiving of history, the circulation of heritage through smaller museums nearby. They make a lot of activities to maintain language, to nurture the development of crafts and other cultural skills. They are a center for political development. Um, the, their crafts and other traditional knowledge skills also are grounds for economic developments in, and innovation. I can't see the screen now. Can you do something about it? And finally, there is also, um, I, I can't see what I'm, I'm supposed to say. I'm sorry, can you do something about the screen? Yeah, I can ask maybe someone from the panel if they can share the screen because I cannot share it. So if our colleagues, uh, that's please. Good. That's great. So uh, and there's also there are also sites for conversations about reparation and healing, which is very important in these days. Um, yes, next slide, please. This is a picture of uh, Gakti, a Sami costume, peering out of the um, peering out of um, the storage at the Norwegian Folk Museum in, in Oslo, and this is to speak to this is um, to um, well-being on an individual level. Of course, it's impossible to speak to individual and societal well-being as separate because they're so intermingled. But what uh, my investigations show is that. Um, that uh, Sami museums are safe spaces. They enable you to speak your own language, to not feel in minority, to feel identity and pride. Um, and and they um, they're like a place where um, the sharing of experiences on a lot of different uh, um, kinds of practices, also including how to become more economically and politically independent and empowered. Next slide, please. Uh, the same goes for, I need, I need to see this, I don't see this. Societal well-being too. Yeah, it's uh, your last slide, societal well-being too. I... Yeah, that's, uh, so I mean you can read what it says on the slide. I want you to go to the last slide, please. So, this picture sums up the mechanisms involved in, in, in what I found in my study. And this picture is from the Sami Pavilion at the Biennale in Venice this year. And of course, my point with showing this picture, which is part of a, a performance by uh, Fedorov, uh, a Sami uh, artist from Finland uh, called Matriarchy, is that none of the, none that the Sami Biennale would never, the Sami Pavilion would never have happened without all these Sami institutions and their long-term work. They offer available space, long-term persistence, room for local participation, egalitarian knowledge production on people's own terms. There, are, um, There's a lot of tangible and intangible uh, heritage that are part of like local practice and, the, and that is continuously being developed and there's a willingness to innovate to develop and and a willingness to engage painful subjects and all these contributes to new forms of political emancipation thank you thank you 
okay so maybe we can still uh, ten, 10 minutes Yeah. Okay, so this is on um, European investment. Uh, there are many programs uh, in Europe supporting cultural heritage, although there is very little information, uh, detailed information. So what we did was to look at uh, the European structural investment funds, Creative Europe, and European Capital of Culture. Here I will only present uh, uh, the mapping we did of investment on cultural heritage from the European Structural Investment Funds. Um, there are many, all the different forms of heritage are supported by structural funds. Here there are some examples. The main source of funding is the European Regional Development Fund. Uh, supporting mainly tangible and digital heritage uh, in uh, European countries and region. There is very small investment from the European social funds, mainly on intangible from what we could uh, uh, map. And then the European territorial cooperation projects uh, support tangible and mixed heritage and also the European Agricultural Fund for Euro Rural Development has uh, some important investments on uh, rural, local uh, heritage. And here is the mapping we did. We look first at the open cohesion platform. There are two investment categories that are focused on heritage, on cultural heritage. Uh, one on uh, protection development and promotion of public cultural and heritage assets, and the other on services. Uh, the first one is the most important, and overall, according to this data, about 2.4% uh, of total ERDF allocation are going on these two categories of investment. And here is the mapping uh, in terms of regions where investments are higher uh, compared to, to others. However, when we looked at national database, we asked our... Um, expert, country expert, to check in national database if uh, there were additional fundings on cultural heritage that are not classified by managing authorities in, those, in these two categories. And indeed, looking at uh, national data, we found that there is much more investment. So the, the official uh, cohesion database is underestimating ERDF expenditure on, uh, on heritage. And so looking also at national database, it seems that there are about 3% um, of total ERDF allocations go to uh, cultural heritage, uh, 5.9 billion of uh, euros. Uh, and also the ESF has some investments. Here we had to use keywords to see whether there was something on heritage, because there is no uh, category from the ESF that al allow us to, to check how much it is spent on, uh, on heritage. So we found that there are about uh, um, uh, 449 projects for 128 million, and this is the distribution. And also um, the European Agriculture and Rural Development Fund. Here we had to look at uh, another <laughs> database, the online uh, portal on projects and practices. Here the information is only at a country level. And we found that there are 19 countries that has invested from this fund on um, heritage project for about 8.03 million uh, euros. And again, here you can see the countries with the highest investment uh, in, uh, in uh, heritage from this fund. And the highest is Ireland. And uh, in two minutes, there will be the Irish case studies, which was funded with the leader uh, program uh, under the um, European Agriculture Rural Development Fund. And then finally, the, sorry, 
the European territorial investments uh, projects in uh, heritage again uh, um, uh, the online portal KPU allow us to see using keywords how many projects are funded that deal with heritage. It is a bit more than a thousand projects for 1.1 million uh, of, uh, of euro in the 1420 programming period. Uh, we, so what we did was a very difficult mapping on how much uh, the European Structural Investment Fund spend on uh, heritage. And here one main uh, implication is that we need to have better data on uh, how cohesion policy and structural funds invest in uh, uh, cultural heritage. So to have specific categories also at regional level in order to be able to assess how much it is spent and to do an evaluation on the impacts on, of this spending on uh, local uh, um, areas, on, on the regions and country level. What we could do only at this point was to do a very simple correlation analysis, correlating spending in ERDF from the cohesion database with our indicators of societal well-being. And the correlation are very small. We expected that because it is a very complex relationship, but the sign is what we were expecting. So positive effects on uh, indicators of well-being, negative effects on negative <laughs> indicator of well-being, like poverty risks or uh, net, net rate and, and so on. The spending on ERDF was also used in the econometric analysis, uh, the regression analysis, but it didn't come up with a significant, it, the sign was the right one, but the significant was very low. So, so I just leave the floor to the Irish case, five minutes, and thank you for your patience. Uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you for not going on the tour, anybody that's left. Um, uh, so, um, are the slides up? I don't know. Yes, that's fine. Oh, that was quick. Um, well, hello, it may seem a little strange. I, I'm actually in Scotland presenting the Irish case study, uh, but this was quite fortuitous as advocates for community-led development in Scotland and Ireland have worked closely together. Uh, on the program that I'm talking about. In some ways, Scottish developments have been seen as a model for the approach in Ireland. Uh, this is a case study of a process reaching back over 20 years. Uh, the community-led village design statements that formed the basis of the case study began in 2000, in the year 2000 in Ireland. Uh, village design statements aim to raise public awareness of heritage assets and to provide design guidelines to enhance and protect local distinctiveness and local heritage features. They were a direct response to the challenges presented to the culture and heritage of Ireland's villages and towns presented by the tiger economy years in Ireland when demand for housing and construction encroached on rural towns and villages. Uh, as this map shows, Ireland is a country of towns and villages and is still projected to have the highest rate of urbanisation across the EU. Uh, the design statement is expected to consider a range of heritage characteristics such as the historic village form and settlement pattern, streetscape, landmarks and protected structures, natural heritage and national monuments. The subsequent implementation was taken forward with a range of partners, including EU leader programmes and the tourism trade body, uh, Falchia Island. There was an enthusiastic take up by communities with uh, 40 villages participating in the first phase. Um, heritage issues and initiatives appeared in... No, heritage, uh, that's... Well, I'll leave that slide, that's fine. Her Back a slide, please. Um, heritage issues and initiatives appeared in various ways. For example, in Newmarket and Hogginston, the conservation of both the historic core of the town and the surrounding natural heritage of Fenland are considered. Uh, Tullerone addressed improving streetscape and introducing a community festival. Mulrani included a new promenade walkway to link up amenities, including leisure and culture amenities, and to attract new visitors. In staple towns, the lack of public green space and community facilities featured as key issues. And in Tallow, uh, the design statement included a heritage map and proposed the creation of a new heritage center. 
The programme evaluation of 2008 revealed similar flaws to those found by an earlier evaluation of Vancouver's internationally recognised community-led approach to local development, particularly loss of community confidence through lack of community capacity and length of time needed for results to show. The, prog the programme began in its current form in 2009 as a collaborative approach to village planning and a community-led village design statement toolkit was published in 2012 to support and improve the program. This is a step-by-step -step guide and aims to support villagers to become actively involved in shaping their local environments and landscapes, to play a major role in heritage and environmental planning and development, and to establish partnerships with local authorities and other bodies. The team that had driven the design statement approach in Heritage Ireland took the learning from the initiative into the development of Ireland's collaborative town centre health check programme in 2016 evolving the community-led approach to historic towns and villages. The new programme was based on the vitality and viability of historic town centres being dependent on how people use them, including changing demographics and living and travel to work patterns, as well as consumer preferences and trends. It was also designed to address the lack of a green book type of specific place-based approach to planning and a lack of community involvement and development. Um, next slide, please. In fact, skip to the next slide as well. Um, the initiative and to the next slide. Thank you. The initiative was based on a 15 step process that made for a pretty comprehensive framework for any town to embrace community led development. While the steps don't seem to directly address intangible cultural heritage, the process of applying them allows communities to prioritize and develop intangible cultural heritage. The initiative made its way into the 2020 Irish Government Programme for Government, Our Shared Future, and it responds to a number of international conventions, including the European Landscape Convention and the Aarhus Convention, particularly the right to participate in environmental decision-making. As well as fostering participative democracy, the Collaborative Town Centre Health Check process aimed to develop an innovative town centre-led retail, cultural heritage and tourism baseline which will be recognised internationally as best practice. It also aims to raise awareness that historic town centres play a critical role in socioeconomic, environmental and cultural growth and development, and on quality of life for citizens. Over 70 organisations and 50 towns were involved in the programme at the time of writing, including government departments, agencies, regional assemblies, local authorities, uh, third level organisations, business representative organisations and civic society. Um, next slide, please. Because the programmes are driven by local community initiatives and needs, they are, also, they are unique. For example, in Sligo, where local development had become detached from a strong heritage estate, key outputs included spatial data and the strengthening of evidence-based decision-making. In Skibbereen, community development of high-speed broadband produced a range of well-being and cultural benefits. Tipperary was very run down, and the Health Check survey revealed local demand for tackling derelict buildings alongside the use of music festivals and cultural events to attract tourism. Across the piece, they have been a powerful force to involve young people in local development and for the introduction of a more holistic approach where culture and well-being are considered alongside economic and spatial factors. Next slide, please. As noted, the evolution of the programme has been supported by peers in Scotland, particularly Scotland's Town Centre Partnership, where a similar approach is now embedded in the country's development process. This has been important as Ireland's progress has been largely driven by the efforts of a very small cohort of people, Alison Harvey of the Heritage Council and Tara Buckley of the Retail, Grocery, Dairy and Allied Trades Association deserve a shout out for driving the programme on very limited resources. Slide, please. As in most places where community-led development is pursued, progress is hard fought. The original trajectory of the Health Check programme was ambitious aiming to be, quote, world leading and profoundly impactful at the level of national policy. Progress has been more pragmatic, with some disappointment over how the work has been incorporated into Ireland's town centre first policy. However, progress there is, and the final consultation on the draft of the second Sustainable Development Goals National Implementation Plan for 2022 to 24, published in May, includes the collaborative town centre uh, health checks as a case study. It also considers how well-being is related to overall quality of life across economic, social and environmental factors. I live in the city celebrated for Patrick Geddes and his call to think global and act local. 
I think the case study shows there are case for European institutions to support those working to progress community-led development at national and local levels, and to support the kind of transnational cooperation that has been so fruitful in the case of Ireland and Scotland. There is a wealth of open access supporting material available for in people interested in this case study. Heritage Island has open access resources online, and Alison Harvey's LinkedIn account has material and links, including a series of extra excellent podcasts about the programme. So I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. I think we have two minutes and a half, maybe three maximum. If one question, uh, so if somebody has a question, maybe we can take one question, but I'm sorry, not more than this. If not, the race was very difficult. Yes, I, I would like to thank you very much, the thank entire you. team, for, for this uh, magnificent chain of presentations. I know that was a heavy load of information, but uh, the team are going to stay with us, yes, exactly. at least those that are not online but in presence. Uh, the tour is now postponed to the very end of the day. So for those of you that we had some sort of, you know, communication using some, some social media also in the group. So um, you have a coffee break right now. Then we'll have a final session in the auditorium. And then for those of you that would like to sacrifice a bit of your free time, then right after the, uh, the end of the day, we have a tour, very likely. But uh, stay in contact for further information. And then, of course, we meet up for, for dinner, right, at the uh, place that you've seen in the program. Thank you again very much to the team. Thank you. Thank you.